morning, 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 everybody. Morning, everybody. Thanks, Susie. <laughs> morning. Welcome if you're online. Welcome if you're here. It's just so good just to see you guys here early. I saw people getting prayed for before service. It's just good to be here early together. Let's stand as we just pass your heart and worship. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you're here with us. We just invite your presence even more. We thank you that you have made a way for us to be here. You've made a way for us to be with you. We thank you, Jesus, that sometimes we have to give a sacrifice of praise and we have to tell our hearts and tell our soul like to come into line with what we have. And so I just thank you, Jesus, that we just praise you. We just praise you. We thank you that that is our sacrifice of just the praise that comes from our mouth. We thank you, Jesus, for the way that you've made. We just invite your presence even more in Jesus' name.
We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Be welcome in this place. Be welcome in this place today. We welcome you with praise. All blessing and honor comes from you. We give you praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost. Let's sing praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above. our voices and we sing
with the voices you've gifted us. All creatures cry out, holy, holy is the Lord, holy, holy are you, Lord. We stand in awe in your presence, in awe of the glory and wonder that you bring, in awe of your goodness and mercy and grace that's ever flowing, flowing like a river, yeah, it's flowing like a river.
paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life from the dead, oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead, oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead, oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life. For those of you who are streaming, you can get yourself prepared to celebrate communion with us. And if you do not have uh, the cup and the wafer, can you show your hand so that the ushers can give one to you so that you can celebrate with us? keep coming back to celebrating communion regularly. Sometimes it's called the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. 
we keep coming back to it because we're at the foundation of our identity. We are at the core of our identity, who we are as human beings. We don't become truly, fully, authentically human until we come into relationship with Jesus, until our relationship with the Father is restored. And so that's, that's all rooted in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus yet, if you haven't committed your life to Jesus, we want to invite you to do that so that you can celebrate with us and enter into uh, the fullness of who you are as a human being. Um, the, the Eucharist, communion, Lord's Supper is rich and deep in significance and meaning. And so we're going to come back to our part in that story. Uh, the restoration, the freedom, the cleansing, uh, the empowering that all happens because of a relationship restored with our God and King. So the scripture says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then the scriptures go on to say something that's really interesting. And it says that whenever you celebrate the Lord's Supper, discern the body. Discern the body. That means to analyze and make some decisions. Our identity, the identity that we receive, that's restored to us when we give our lives to Jesus, is not just an individual identity, but it's a corporate identity. And this whole passage that talks about the Lord's Supper and the broken body of Jesus Christ for us is not just the literal body of Jesus that was broken, but it also speaks of the body as a metaphor that we all come into Christ's body when we uh, give our lives to Jesus and we're to discern the body, meaning if there's a rip or a tear or a wound or some dysfunction in the body, communally, if relationships are not what they should be, if there's some sort of wound, then we want to make that right so that the body is made whole and unified and healed. And so we want to do that now. We're going to spend... A few moments in silence. Don't be afraid of silence. Silence is the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to speak, give us self-awareness, show us where in the body is there a wound that we can restore and heal. So let's, let's give the Lord a few moments of silence to speak to us.
let's all take the bread together. The broken body of Jesus, broken for us to restore us and make us whole individually and as a community. Jesus shed for us symbolizing the new covenant and the new life that we have in Jesus. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Son. We praise you, Holy Spirit. We are grateful. We are grateful that you've restored us and given us our true identity, made us heirs heirs with you, co-regents on your throne. Bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, uh, ushers will come around and pick up the cups. Morning, church. Wow. Such a beautiful time of worship and communion. So good to be together. If this is your church family, you get the privilege of giving. (laughs) Giving is part of of being part of God's family. You know, he gives, we give, it's all his. And um, yeah, this is the privilege of being part of a family. God's family. Um, you can give at vineyardofharvest.org slash give. I've just been thinking a lot of stewardship this last week. I'm just going to pray. God, I just thank you for the privilege of giving. I just thank you, God, that you are such a good father. I thank you that we don't lack anything in you. And I thank you that you're teaching us how to be a good steward of the life that you've given. And that's finance as well, God. I just thank you that even as we step into even more into 2022, that we would just ask you, what's your heart? Where do you want us to give? We just ask that you expend our capacity in lots of ways, God, but also in giving because that's your heart. We thank you for that, Jesus. Amen. Welcome if you're new. We're so glad that you're here with us in person and online. It's just good to be together. I've seen some faces I haven't seen for a while. It's so good. Um, If you'd like to connect, we would like to connect with you guys. You can sign up to a small group. We just started. Um, Vineyardofharvest.org slash connect is also a way that you can connect, and someone here will reach out to you to get together. Um, Who signed up for a small group and started to go to a small group this last week? Oh, yeah. Okay, so let me tell you that you've got an opportunity. It's only just started, and some of them are open. So please, if you haven't joined one already, please start. And the great thing is, some of them are face-to-face. So if that's something that you're after, come and join us face-to-face. It's just good. Maybe grab a friend and get them to connect as well in. Um, You might have seen when we came, when you came in this morning, we had our prayer team um, praying here. Um, So basically, we've changed and shifted times for prayer. So it's going to be at 10.15 to 11. At the back around here, you'll see them. Please join in. I know people are coming and going and doing different things on Sunday mornings, but even if you're serving in different areas, pause for five minutes and come and pray with our team. We'd also love to pray for you guys. So at 10.45 to 11, pause and get prayer. I got prayer this morning and I was just like, oh, it was a surprise and it was beautiful and I'm so thankful. So thank you for that person that prayed for me. Um, Another announcement for prayer is that 
Inner Healing we've extended today. So it is now on Wednesday nights and Thursday nights, and you can sign up for an Inner Healing prayer session, which will, you can, if you, if you just send an email out to prayer at vineyardofharvest.org, someone will get in contact with you. And basically, Inner Healing Prayer, it's about an hour and a half session, and it's really beautiful. Um, it's just a deep encounter of God's love for inner healing, healing of maybe past hurts, abuse even. So many different aspects of our life can kind of just hold us back in areas, and God wants to speak His truth and bring us into healing and encounter His love. I signed up twice this last pandemic, and I was so blessed, literally just an encounter with God's love. And as Glenn was mentioning before, everything is about calling us into His identity, what He sees over us, what He speaks over us, and um, I was just really blessed just because, you know, there's some lies that hold us back the way that we see ourselves, but God has a higher word and a higher truth, yeah? So I would encourage you, if that's something that's on your heart, even if someone's m name comes to mind, sign up for inner healing, you'll be blessed. Right now, why don't we take a moment to say hi to someone that you haven't said hi to before, turn around and maybe ask them what their high or maybe what their low was of the week. All right. Good morning again, guys. Welcome to church, and uh, welcome to you guys online, too. Glad that you guys are tuning in with us. So this morning, we're continuing our series called Relationship Goals. We're talking about all sorts of relationships in our lives and what the Bible, what God speaks to us about these relationships. Today, we're talking about relationship with ourselves, and our, our dear friend, our good friend James Chong is here today to preach to us. Um, he comes a couple times a year. So he's the Vice President of Strategy and Innovation for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Um, he's a vineyard pastor. He's been in the vineyard for many years. Most importantly, he's a good friend of our church, and we're always grateful to have him with us. So let's give a warm video wage welcome to James Chong as he brings the word. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Pastor Dennis. Ah, it's good to be with you all 2022. What's going on? Happy New Year uh, on the lunar calendar as well. And um, yes, and I'll actually, I'll be back next month. So you'll see me in, I think, four weeks time. Um, so it'll be great to be with you all. Um, well, hey, uh, 2022, we are still in the throes of this pandemic, aren't we? And uh, so I, you know, to create a little levity, I started looking up jokes about the pandemic, right? Um, I told one during warm-up, it got a lot of booze, so you're going to get the one that I think is supposed to be a little bit better, but you'll still probably boo me out, okay? So here's the joke about the pandemic. It goes like this. Uh, two grandmothers were getting together, and they were bragging about their precious little darlings, right? And as they were bragging and going back and forth, one grandma says, the other grandma says, you know what, my, my grandkids are so careful. They're so good. They're socially distancing so well that they don't even call me. Okay, there you go. Yes, uh, that is a joke. But it, it is kind of like that. It is during the pandemic. This is a, an illness that has rocked the globe and it has in many ways separated us from one another. And we've seen the effects of that, whether that we don't want to transmit it to each other or for various reasons. It's separated us and put us into different tribes. There's ways that it has actually done a lot so that we are not connecting with each other in the same way. But that's not the only illness that does that. And that's not the only thing that can keep us from each other. And today in our text, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 5. And we're going to meet a woman whose own illness kept her from other people as well. And sort of from that, um, my hope is that we'll learn more about us, our relationship with God, and how uh, the Lord might want to speak to us this day. So let me pray for us, and we'll get started. We welcome your presence, Father. 
You are a good, good God, and you love us. And even if the world feels like it's falling apart around us, we know, Lord, that you, we know how the story ends, and we know that you are making all things right, and in the end, all things will be according to your will and for your glory. So, Lord, as we long for that day, I pray, God, that your spirit, as we meet and have the habit of meeting each week, that you, you would meet us, you would be with us, your spirit would show us the things that you want us to hear. And if I say anything that is from you, Lord, you would allow that to be seeds planted in good soil so that it might bear much fruit. And if I say anything that is not from you, you would keep it from our ears so that it wouldn't even register, so that only your word would remain. Have your way with us. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, let's go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 5. We'll start in verse 25, which puts us in the middle of a story that actually played out from the beginning in Mark uh, in chapter 21. But I want to zero in on this particular story starting in 25. And uh, it says this in, in 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we were being introduced to a woman who's had bleeding for 12 years. And in the trying to get better with her illness, she spent all that she had. Um, that, on one hand, right, that's bad enough. But there's implications for her bleeding that actually has had a bigger impact on her life than even just being sick. And the reason for that is because she was bleeding, there was something in the Old Testament that actually said that she was ceremonially unclean. Um, I don't have a slide for this, but it comes out of Leviticus chapter 25, um, and it starts from verse, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, Leviticus chapter 15, and it starts from verse 25 and goes to 27. And this is the, the word that would have been in, in force during the time of this woman, during the time of Jesus in the Jewish community. And it said, when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period, and this is going to get a little TMI, but it's in the scripture, uh, uh, monthly board, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge just in the days of her period. Any bed she lies in while her discharge continues will be unclean as in her bed during her monthly period, and anything she sits on will be unclean as during her period. Anyone who touches them will be unclean and must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean until evening. And so it's a crazy ordinance. And there's other stuff, just if you feel like this is being really unfair to women. Later in the chapter, there's something for men, too. But uh, what you're seeing here is in the Jewish community, the, the desire to be pure or clean was, not, was such an important facet. And the people was supposed to be a people that were clean, that becoming unclean or impure became this, uh, not quite a sin, but it can make you a social outcast. And for this woman who was bleeding that was outside of her normal biology, she would have been considered unclean. And not only her, but anything she slept in, anything she lied on, anything that touched her would also become unclean. Okay, so imagine that. A whole world for 12 years where you're considered unclean. No one wants to get near you or touch you because although it's not a sin, the, the trouble of going through the ceremonial bathing to become clean later uh, and being unclean kept you from worship. It kept you from going either in the old times to the tabernacle or to the temple. It kept you from being able to worship in community. So no one wanted to be unclean. It was a hassle to become clean again if you became unclean. And so if you can imagine then, this woman for 12 years, anything she sat on, anything she wore, anybody she touched became ceremonially impure and unclean. So much so then, uh, most but scholars, or if you're taking guesses about her, she probably never got married or was divorced, right? Because anyone who touched her would become unclean. And you can see then, this is something that would become who she was. An identity that she might carry around as one who suffers or one who is unclean. Someone who would have felt the weight of a society telling her that she is impure and not able to worship in the presence of God. Can you imagine what that would feel like? Well, in that way, the question back to you all is, in what ways in your life do you feel unclean or impure? Are there things in your life where you just feel like that's, it's there? And I'm not here to, to make a condemnation, but 
You know, when you think about that thing, maybe it's something you've done, or maybe it's a characteristic you don't like about, or there's an interaction that you had, and all of a sudden as you think about it or you dwell on it, your face gets hot, or you can break out into a sweat, or a sense of shame starts to kick into you. You just feel like, oh, you know, there's something that's separating me from someone else. That that thing that makes you feel unclean gives you that sense of like, if people really knew me and knew that thing about me, they would judge me or they wouldn't accept me. And so in a ways, it, in the same way as it would have done in the Old Testament, it separates you from people or your community or the people that you're meant, your family, the people that you're meant to be with. It can be something that keeps you apart from them. And you carry that around uh, as a shame. Now, 12 years to carry that for her, right? Like, that just means every sign of the Chinese zodiac, right? She would have, through every single year of that, whether it was dog or pig or ox, she would have felt this uncleanliness. And for many of us, throughout our whole lives, like, there it could be something that we've carried since childhood or something that we've carried for a long time that makes us feel unclean, impure, not worthy to be in God's presence, not worthy to be in front of his people. Well, it's here where she's, she's, you get a sense, she's heard then, this woman has heard about Jesus, and she concocts a plan. Right? She's like, well, she's desperate, she's got to figure out what to do, she's heard about this man, Jesus, he heals people, maybe if I do something about this, then I might be healed. And she comes up with a plan, and this is what she ends up doing. And we, we'll get to now verse 27. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Okay, so what's great about the passage is she then, in her distress, in the place where she was for 12 years, she went, well, at least she's she's thinking rightly. I'm going to go to Jesus, right? That's a good answer. We're here in church. Go to Jesus. So she hears about the man, she's going to go to him, and she goes, I, if I touch him, I'm going to get healed, and so goes out of her way to do that. There's a big crowd, it's a good plan, no one's going to know, and I can steal a touch. Um, but what's the problem with this? When she touches Jesus, according to the laws of the Old Testament, then Jesus would become unclean. This holy man, this righteous man, the one who's teaching people about how to come near to God, in her action, right, she's going to touch the man. She's going to make Jesus unclean by her move. And so you can imagine there might be something where she's torn about that. Like, ah, if I touch him, it's against the law, or at least it's going to make him unclean. I shouldn't do that. But then, hey, I've been suffering for this for 12 years. I need to do something like this. And in the tornness or in the tension, she goes out and goes out of her way and says, okay, I'm going to touch him. And then does it. And in the instant she does, she is healed. Immediately, her bleeding stops. And you would think then, all right, her plan worked. Now it's time to get out of here, right? Like the bank robber who just got, we got the money. Let's roll before the cops come. She's like, okay, she's done it. Now it's time to get out of Dodge. And it's here where Jesus does something that can seem really cruel in one sense. But you can see in the cruelty, the quote-unquote cruelty of it, he's doing something that's actually meant for more blessing, for more healing in this woman's life. So we get to verse 30, and it says this. <laughs> my eyes are starting to go, so i got to pull up my glasses when I read. Um, At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? Now, you see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Okay? So in this text, Jesus knows that power has gone out from him. Probably knows, though we don't know from the text, that somebody was healed through what has happened. He, being God, could just go like, hey, you got your thing. All right, blessings. Get on out of here, right? Not make a big fuss of it. But in the middle of a crowd that's pressing up against him, he's going to stop the whole show and goes, well, who touched me? You know, who touched me? And he's looking around. Disciples, right, get the craziness of what Jesus is doing. He's like, well, you see, 
Jesus, almost, I get the sense that the disciples are getting a little sarcastic with the rabbi. You know, you see the whole crowd around you, Jesus. Come on. Like, it could have been any of us. What do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. What are you making a big deal of it? Let's go on and continue on. And they were heading to a synagogue leader's house named Jairus. Let's just keep going. Why are you stopping the show here? But Jesus kept looking around, kept trying to see who did it. Why has he stopped the show? Why is he going to do this? Potentially bringing even greater shame to a woman who has suffered for so long. Why would Jesus do such a thing? Well, we'll find out as we go on. Uh, It says in verse 33, um, Then the women, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Okay, so there's more going on. Uh, I love the fact that Jesus is taking the initiative here, and he's, like, making everything, like, we need to stop the show. This is really important. And in his actions, creates the space. And the woman still has a chance to just bail, right? It's her choice. She could, she could get away. She could see that the rabbi, Jesus, is looking around to see who touched him. But he, she could still take off in the crowd. It's her choice. But she knows what Jesus is asking, and she sees the invitation out there. And instead of running away to her great courage and her trust in who the rabbi is, says, okay, I'm just going (laughs) to confess it. I'll just come and say it, and we'll see what happens, right? So she she comes, and she she says, uh, falls to his feet, is what the text tells us, and tells him, trembling with fear, tells him the whole truth. And that's how they get this whole story about the 12 years of bleeding and with her being... Uh, Blood driver finances in in the seeking of better healing. Jesus made the invitation. She didn't have to respond, but in her response, she confesses the whole truth about what happens, right? And she doesn't know what's going to happen. She has fear about it, obviously, because it says she's trembling with fear. But in her action is showing how much she trusts what Jesus is going to do. And then Jesus then says, daughter... Your faith has healed you. Your trust in me has healed you, right? Faith is put your trust in. Go in peace. And the word peace, right, it's shalom. Uh, It could be translated into shalom in the Hebrew, although this is in the Greek. Uh, That it's not just a, a peace like an absence of conflict, but this is a peace where everything is made right. The relationships are right. Your soul is made right. Everything is in the right way. It's, it's what you and your community is supposed to be. Shalom is a sense where it's all made right. In a sense, it's what heaven is supposed to be like, this shalom. And he says to her, you can go in this shalom. You can actually go in a sense of feeling right about it all and be freed from your suffering. She was already healed. So what does this mean to be freed from her suffering? Well, Jesus knew that she was physically healed, but the physical healing wasn't enough. She would go around, tell everyone that she did this little secret, uh, this kind of secret agent kind of thing, and got away with it and got her healing. But there would always be the thing deep down in her conscience that said, maybe I made the holy man unclean, and maybe I did something that wasn't quite right. And maybe, I don't know if I should be sharing this story with a lot of people because I'm not exactly sure if it was a good thing or a right thing. And that sense of guilt or the sense of shame could still be within her. And Jesus was saying, your physical healing, that's not enough. I want the whole thing. I want you to be freed from your suffering. And I just got to imagine that's more than your physical suffering. But the suffering that you've incurred because of your illness and because of this law That for 12 years, you have been separated from people, you've been isolated, you've been alone, and you've carried this sense of shame in yourself. So Jesus is saying, come, tell the truth in front of everyone, and then I'm going to bless you, that you can go in peace, that you were freed from your suffering. And so he does the cruel act of making her share it in front of the crowd. 
but not because he's trying to taunt her, not because he's trying to belittle her, but because he wants her full freedom. And it's when she was able to share the story and still receive blessing that you can imagine there was nothing left of wrong or guilt or shame to carry with her any longer. She could be fully free. This is what Jesus wants for all of us. We're meant to be fully free. And the reason why we can be is because Jesus himself took the initiative with us. Our sins are, I'm, I'm not here to say that sin isn't important or that it can be brushed aside. They have to be acknowledged and they are serious. But what Jesus is, has done and what he has done and this is what the whole Christian faith is based upon is that 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross, he took the penalty and power of sin with him. And that died with him on the cross. Three days later when he came back to life, a new world and a new life was possible. We can actually live in God's presence free of guilt free of shame because the penalty of that, the payment was paid for and the power of that sin has been broken. We no longer have to walk in shame. It no longer has to control us any longer. The Christian faith gives us hope because it's been done for us. In Jesus' initiative for us, we can be free because of the cross and the resurrection, because he lives. And the invitation to us is that we get to die with Jesus on the cross to let all of that die with him and entrusting him, letting a new life bubble up. This is what we can do. This is what we can embrace out of God's great initiative toward us. We cannot self-help our way into feeling guilt-free. We cannot white-knuckle our way into feeling free on our own. We cannot forgive ourselves on our own. But we can respond to God's initiative, knowing that God is taking care of that, that. And we place our trust in what God has done for us. We are forgiven, not because of my attitude or optimism, but because we have hope, because Jesus has already done it for us. And one day we will all rise again, where shalom will reign. This is where we are going, and we trust that the story has been written. We know how the story ends, and we will go there with them. And in the meantime, as we're here now, and as we struggle with our uncleanliness and our impurities, do we trust the work of the cross in our lives enough to trust that God did the payment enough, that he actually took that thing that you are carrying seriously enough to come as a person and die? so that we might truly live. That's what we're being offered, to be free fully, to be made who we're meant to be. It's in that application then, as I just look at what Jesus did with this young woman, or um, mature woman, actually, I don't know how old she is, but for 12 years, she had suffered for a while. What are the ways that we can respond? I think the main response that kept coming to mind, particularly for many of us who still struggle to forgive ourselves, who still struggle to sort of like go like, well, yeah, I hear what you did, God, but I'm not quite sure, is that there's an invitation here for us. And one, uh, the first invitation is that we confess to God. Just to be, to no longer play, to share prayers that we think God wants to hear from us. But to be honest about who we are, honest about where we're coming from, and saying, God, this is, this is all the junk that I've done, and to confess that before God. And maybe it, in that prayer, as we say, God, we know who we are, but we trust what you've done in our lives, that we might be able in our identity to shift from one who suffers to one who is freed, to one who feels shame, to one who lives in glory, to move as one who has felt like a prisoner, to one who knows freedom fully. And, you know, that takes time. That's, uh, there are times when that g God does that in a way that releases us in, in power. And there are times we have to keep coming back and reminding ourselves that this is what's true about us and we can trust in the work of God. So if one application is confessing to God, and we're actually going to get a chance to do that at the end of this talk, 
The second application is to confess to each other. And it's, a, uh, it's the confessing to each other that doesn't get a whole lot of play in, uh, in Protestant churches in particular. Uh, but it's something that we need to come back to. Because there's something about, uh, as people made in God's image, what we say has power and impact. As God who created worlds with a word, so us, as we talk and speak, there's something that happens that gets created. And as we share these things out loud with each other, we're sort of saying, okay, this is the stuff I've been carrying in my head. And it's the, it's the stuff that bubbles around, it gets distorted as we look at it, but when we put it out into the open and other people can then speak into it with the love of God, it can take away its power, it can take away its sting, it can help us find again what is truly true in our lives and not to let these things dominate in us. Uh, I have a, my best, one of my best friends, uh, we have had a monthly rhythm of confessing to each other since March of 2019, so the last almost three years. It has been such a lifeline during this pandemic. Um, and someone who's also, he's a, he's a colonel in the Air Force, so he's, he's got some leadership, but he loves the Lord, and we're as different as anything. You know, he's, he's a tall kid who grew up on a farm. Uh, our, uh, I'm a city kid. Uh, our politics are like so far from each other. There's a lot of things. There's no reason for us to really be friends except for that we both love Jesus. And yet every month for two hours, we have a set of questions. One of those questions, and we've recently changed the wording of it so that it would help us just desire to confess more, is like, what do you want to confess? What do you want to confess? What do you, not what do you need to confess, what you should, should you confess, what the Lord leads you to confess. We're like, what do you want to confess? Because what we're trying to help each other know is when we do that, there's freedom that's being offered. And I got to tell you, it has been times where, you know, this is a Zoom call since he lives across the country, but there'll be time I'll be in tears or he'll be in tears or there'll be places where conviction will fall in a place of uh, something that we didn't even think about before we started the call. But it's this rhythm of confessing to each other the things that we know are broken in our lives and saying, Lord, would you forgive us? And in the sacrament of that confession, we have found freedom. And my, my charge to you, if you don't have a place where you can share like that, ask the Lord to provide that for you and try to look around and see if the Lord, in his initiative, might help you find someone like that. Um, I, I would say, like, be careful about that. I'm not just like, so don't hear me saying, like, just grab, hey, after service, just grab someone and tell them your deepest, darkest secrets, right? I'm, that's not what I'm saying, because you do want to do this in a wise way. I'm saying, please respond to the initiative of God in your life. Let him lead you to the people. You want to find people who take the sin and acknowledge it as serious, but is gracious and gentle with you, because God is gentle with us. Someone who will receive you and accept you rather than pour judgment or be your coach. You know, is gonna, they're going to help you white-knuckle your way through holiness. No, you want someone who's going to be gentle with your soul. Find people that you can be that with, and you will find the sting of the shame releasing itself over time. You will find the power of that sin in your life losing it. As I'm seeing my life align more with what God wants in me, like this, not a perfect straight line, but ups and downs. But I can see over the last three years what God has done through this relationship. Will you find someone that you can share the whole truth so that you can be freed with your, from your suffering? So in, in sum, those of you who have felt there's something in your life, you've just felt like it's made you unclean, it's made you impure, and if you just shared it even with someone here at Vineyard of Harvest, they would reject you and judge you and look at you askance and say, no, you don't belong here. Those are all fears from the enemy that's trying to keep you from each other. This is, that's one of those illnesses like the pandemic that is keeping us from each other and what God has meant for us to be and become. But instead... What if there are ways that we can respond to God's initiative in our lives? And in that, in the confession to him and in the confession to us, each other to align our thoughts and to align our actions with the truth of the gospel in our lives, that he died, that he rose again, 
There's nothing we need to do to be forgiven. We already are in his name. Let's pray. Um, yeah, if you stay in a place of prayer, I want to invite you to listen to the Lord in this moment. And uh, I would like to, as the worship team comes up, that'd be great, but don't play anything. Let's just keep this in silence with the Lord. And what I want to invite you to do is uh, sort of, I'm going to lead you through an exercise to listen. And it's just a way to help us focus on what God is, might be saying to us. I'm not going to put any words there or make him say certain things, nor am I uh, going to say that he might, he will say something to you because um, God is God. And, but we can create those spaces to hear from the Lord. Um, and so I do want to give us a chance to do that. I do, uh, as I was praying for the talk this morning, I did see the number seven as I was praying. And for me, that's, a, and in the scriptures, a word of completion. That the Lord's, I think wanted to, the Lord wanted to impress upon us this morning that his work is complete. That there's nothing we need do. We need merely respond and receive. Uh, the, his work on the cross is complete in your life. You no longer are unclean. You are no longer impure in his presence. You can always come. But it's in that that I wanted to invite us to a place where we are hearing from the Lord to hear what he might say to us. And so uh, just uh, in, uh, if you don't mind, actually, would you, if you're able, would you stand? And uh, it's a way for us to be attentive to what God might be saying. Um, if you're also willing, go ahead and put your palms up as a posture of reception. And I want to, you to envision that you're, you're, uh, you're standing in a room. Uh, yeah, and just you, pick a room uh, that you like. There's a room that you're comfortable in. Maybe it's in your home or someplace you know. And uh, take a look around. What does the room look like? In your mind's eye, what do you see? And as you're standing there, uh, how do you feel about being in this room? Well, Father, we pray that your spirit would lead this time. And Lord, what is from you, make happen. Whatever is not from you, just don't let it happen. Spirit, have your way with us. So as you're in this room, uh, you notice there's a door in front of you, and as the door opens, oh, uh, Jesus walks in. Uh, what does he look like? What's he wearing? Uh, he looks at you, and you can see by the look in his eyes that he, uh, that he loves you, um, What's the expression he's wearing on his face as he comes in? He comes into the room. Jesus greets you. How does he greet you? After the greeting, Jesus points to something on your forehead. Um, and then you notice for the first time, there's something there. It's a, it's a word that's written on your forehead. And it's a word that describes how you feel in God's presence. What is that word? It's a word that sort of identifies you if you were in front of God. And it's a word that's just there. And a word that isn't something that God necessarily would agree with, but it's a word you carry. What is that word? You're a little embarrassed that Jesus sees the word, but Jesus points at it. He's not being malicious about it. He comes up and he... Um, goes out and he just sort of takes his arm and he rubs the word off your forehead and instead with his finger just draws another word there 
it, you can't tell, you don't have a mirror of what's written, but you can tell by the impression that the finger is making on your forehead. You know what the word is. What's the word that Jesus is giving you there about who you are? What is the word that he's giving you across your forehead? After that, um, he leans in close, and he tells you something he's been wanting to say to you for a while. What does Jesus say to you? Oh, Holy Spirit, whatever is from you, Lord, would you stoke that? Would you help us to remember it? Would you give us a sense that this is from you, Lord? Help us to hear you. Help us to hear what you're saying about us. And Lord, if there's something that you are really just saying, like, it's not what you thought it was, it's this, Lord, would you bring that to bear in the name, in your precious name, Lord? Would you bring that to bear? And Lord, so I pray a sealing of that, that, Lord, you would allow us to hear what you're saying. And Lord, whatever's not from you, keep it as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, we want to be the people who are defined by your word to us, defined by who we are in you. So Lord, we ask, Lord, for your presence to help show us and to guide us. And Lord, even to provide the people that you would like us to be able to confess to. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you, James, for that word. Let's sing one song in closing. It's such a fitting song for what the message was today. There's two names of this song, Broken Vessels and Amazing Grace, that we come before God with some of the struggles that we might have, but it's His amazing grace. Let's sing this in response as we close out.
As we close out, if you feel comfortable, put your hands out one more time, palms up to heaven, receive this blessing as we close. This has been a very special time, a season of our church. This past week, God was healing people um, in our prayer meeting on Wednesday night. God's healing anointing was just so strong that, that night when we were together. Started carrying over into our small group times that we've been starting this new trimester this week. We're talking about God's physical healing this morning. If you are here and there's a physical ailment that you have, we want to pray for you. When we close out, our prayer team is going to be off to the side. Also, we like to break into groups and pray too. God's physical healing released to us. But we pressed more this morning on that inner healing piece in the announcements. And then what Pastor James is mentioning is a healing of the heart that God also wants to do. So as we close out, I just want to pray, Lord, come Holy Spirit. Physical healing and inner healing. Healing of past wounds. We're talking about relationship goals, relationship with ourselves, forgiving ourselves. And that's so hard. Pastor James mentioned it. Impossible, actually, apart from God. So come Holy Spirit in this week as we spend time with you, as we spend time with others, as we go about our everyday lives. We say, come Holy Spirit, let your healing power come physically, but also emotionally also mentally, also spiritually. Thank you, Lord, for this word today. Thank you, Lord, for this moment. And I pray your blessings on each one of us and each of our family members and our communities, the things and challenges that lay ahead of us this week. We ask for your power to manifest in our lives that we would give you glory as we navigate in the power of your spirit. Blessings on your people, Lord. We are all your children, your kids. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hey, let's thank the Lord and thank Pastor James for coming out today. Awesome. Our prayer team is over to the side if you'd like to receive prayer. But break into groups if you feel comfortable and you have time. Um, let's pray for each other. God's presence is with us. God bless you guys. Have a great week. And God bless you guys online as well.